Welcome to my presentation, Environmental Humanities in the Second Language Classroom, Teaching Sustainability with a German Accent. A little bit about me, I'm a faculty member in USU's Department of World Languages and Cultures from the Logan campus. I'm also enrolled in ETE's sustainability track. And I wanted to first thank the organizers of this conference, the entire ETE team, for the opportunity to contribute some hopefully fresh themes and approaches for instructors interested in integrating environmental and sustainability issues into their classrooms. Thus far, I have had the opportunity to co-teach one environmental studies class in English with my colleague Heidi Hart, but in several of my other courses, colleagues from different departments and colleges have offered guest lectures on environmental or sustainability related issues. Um, Rob Davis uh, from physics came, at Stafford from management, um, Susan Shapiro from classics, Christine Cooper and Pato from English, Jennifer Peoples from communication studies, to name just a few. And that has always been wonderful and really energizing. And something I wish for uh, would even um, be possible to happen more often would be cross-listing classes that have environmental components. Uh, I think that would be a great way to make connections across campus and start interdisciplinary uh, dialogues. And who knows, even though this is a virtual presentation, maybe some form of dialogue might develop out of that. Uh, that would be fantastic. I would like to share with you some ideas and impulses for integrating sustainability into the classroom, in particular into the second language classroom. And of course, moving to online teaching formats presented new challenges for all of us, and it required many adjustments, uh, both with respect to authenticity materials and methodological underpinnings. And uh, I also want to show how some of these adjustments have played out uh, for me and share some pathways to developing teaching frameworks, virtual and non-virtual, that include environmental perspectives as well as practices and products. My presentation will include some suggestions on how to link student learning outcomes to sustainability, um, combining lower level and higher level cognitive learning outcomes uh, with sustainability issues. And in the broadest sense, my presentation will also include some reflections on what the humanities might contrib contribute to env environmental discourses in the classroom and beyond. I mostly teach upper division culture and literature courses in the target language, um, but over the last few years I've become somewhat discontent with them, some of our more traditional approaches, topics and curricula in my field. Um, and I have begun to explore teaching methods and materials that engage students in more meaningful learning experiences. Uh, for my context, that meant centering language learning around theme-based, culture-driven environmental discourses. So most of my teaching is with a theme-based approach uh, to try to really structure courses around the culture of German-speaking countries. As much as possible, uh, my courses are also structured around authentic materials to help students not just get at products and practices, but also different perspectives that allow students to connect their own environmental behaviors and consciousness and contexts from the US, for example, um, to that which they learn about German or European contexts. Um, my courses are also informed by literacy uh, pedagogy, where I ask students to do critical and interpretive work from early levels. Um, but having said this, uh, I also want to point out that many of the ideas, some of the text, the materials and the approaches that I'm going to talk about can also be adopted for different levels and different contexts. Um, so the course I'm largely going to talk about uh, here was an upper division uh, course structured uh, around the topic nature, landscape, environment, um, but it can translate into other contexts as well. Uh, 
Before we delve into the topic more deeply, a uh, quick summary about methods and materials. So what I advocate are activities from assignments to assessments, uh, units, um, and entire courses that are holistic um, and informed by environmental education pedagogy. So learning about Green Germany is in the context that I offer, theme-based, project-based, immersed, process-oriented and culture-driven. And um, for the German context, the materials can often be springboards uh, for reflections about larger topics, um, topics like nature, landscape and environment. Um, and um, in the next uh, slide, I'm going to uh, offer one example. I, I sort of zoom in on one of the possible entryways into the topic um, and the example that I chose are trees and forests. So examining the meaning of um, the forest or of trees in the German speaking context can be one springboard uh, into a very rich uh, discourse and uh, the images that you see here illustrate uh, just a few examples uh, from um, Albrecht Altdorfer's uh, depiction of um, the forest in the 16th century to um, romanticism uh, depictions of the um, of the forest in Caspar David Friedrich's um, image, uh, Der Chasseur im Walde, that's the second uh, large uh, uh, picture here, to um, illustrations uh, to the Grimm's fairy tales, uh, UBC, Hansel and Gretel, and uh, Little Red Riding Hood, a uh, here, um, um, where the forest always uh, has a very distinct cultural uh, function, uh, but also more contemporary examples uh, on the lower left, uh, we see uh, a very popular German uh, song um, that um, um, articulates uh, a special personal relationship with um, with uh, trees and uh, the the sadness that comes with the loss of loss of a tree. Um, we see das Geheime Leben der Bäume. That is a um, 2020, I think, uh, a documentary based on a book from 2015 by German forester Peter Wohlleben. A tremendously popular bestseller. Uh, um, for many weeks um, in the German bestseller list. And also um, the Netflix series Dark uh, can uh, be such a gateway for conversation about the role of the forest. Here's a list of the six activities or projects that I've engaged my students in. Um, and I will discuss uh, each each of those uh, uh, briefly. So uh, we have the word cloud, the examination of our individual carbon footprints, uh, the um, uh, creation or experience of a mindfulness path, uh, uh, creating an art exhibition of upcycled uh, artworks, uh, um, a monitoring project where students pay attention to um, over a short period of time, uh, a week or three days, how they consume and, and um, what that consumption produces. Or um, uh, the last uh, project was uh, writing a postcard to um, a figure um, that is associated with um, sustainability and environmental awareness, for example, uh, to Greta Thunberg. The first example I'm going to discuss is creating a word cloud. Uh, here you see on the right a reproduction of an authentic um, um, word cloud students produced uh, uh, in class um, uh, associations on uh, nature, so na na nature. And um, um, this is a fairly, fairly simple format. And um, in that format, we couldn't, what for the German language context would be important, we couldn't capitalize nouns. Uh, um, but uh, it, it reflects students' um, association and it is like an artwork that is created uh, together.
Here you can see three examples that are a little more uh, sophisticated with respect to the uh, visual quality uh, representation as well as uh, the textual representation, um, greater nuance and uh, fun, fun, fun to produce in class together. I have become a real fan of creating word clouds. It's a wonderful activity uh, that translates well into virtual classrooms as well. And um, it invites students to pay attention first, to, to become active, use uh, their gadgets and uh, participate in something that we create uh, together. So it um, stimulates engagement and participation. It is interactive. It shares uh, uh, ideas and um, associations from different learners and different contexts. In the language context, it also allows students to recall um, specific terms, uh, vocabulary, certain expressions. Uh, so on the remember level of on the cognitive uh, scale, uh, it is very beneficial, but it also it hones their linguistic skills, but it visualizes the associations in a very helpful way and um, allows us as a group to collectively create a product. So I find that students um, feel a sense of ownership with these word clouds as well. And I always include them uh, in, in my lesson plans, um, which I make available via, via Canvas. The second activity I would like to discuss uh, evolves around measuring your carbon footprint. Now, in parentheses, a little remark ahead. I'm aware that uh, there's a problematic history um, with measuring your carbon footprint because one of the first tools to do so was developed by the British petrol giant BP. Um, and some of the impulse was to deflect corporate responsibility away from the companies onto the individual. But that aside, uh, I think um, measuring your carbon footprint is a wonderful tool in the classroom. So it asks students to calculate their, their footprint, looking at their consumption habit, looking as it, uh, with Fusabdruck.de, the tool I uh, used, uh, um, at uh, how do we, how, how and what do we eat, how do we live, uh, how do we move, so aspects of mobility, and how and what do we consume. Um, and these parameters allow students um, just to, to, to reflect and think more deeply about their own habits and connect to the larger topic of our course and discussion. So how can carbon footprint calculations help students? I think the answer is can vary uh, depending on whether one wants to think more about the kind of habits of mind uh, that are fostered by such reflections, or, or one could uh, argue more specifically for the second language context and uh, what kind of linguistic gain goes hand in hand with such an exercise. So in general, I would say striving for accuracy, um, raising questions, examining problems, thinking and communicating clearly and with precision, these are just general habits of mind that are stimulated. And then um, raising uh, the question as a follow-up, how students might reduce the ecological footprint in particular, I think requires that students apply past knowledge to new situations, that they think independently, that they work creatively, imaginatively, and innovatively. Um, but the um, gain beyond those general um, um, benefits uh, in, in the foreign language context is in particular um, reviewing of a vocabulary, reviewing of a context situation in which students find themselves in their real lives, not just in the classroom. So the connection again of, of um, classroom discussion and personal life beyond the classroom is something that I particularly like. And I've listed here in this slide also uh, some other um, calculators. Um, I'm sure in your own context and in your own field or in your own language, uh, there are many more.
engaging in a mindfulness exercise can be a particularly effectful uh, learning experience as it um, invites students not only to learn cognitively, um, but to transcend traditional academic learning formats and to, um, to learn emotionally as well. Um, I can see different ways of uh, creating a mindfulness a path. Uh, you can either um, um, experience that with your students and I'm going to present uh, to you in the next slide some um, tools I've used to do that or you can invite your students to create their own mindfulness path. One of the excellent tools I have found uh, is by the Schutzgemeinschaft Deutscher Wald. Uh, you see the address there. Um, and what they uh, provide in order to facilitate um, a mindful experience of the forest is it's really quite marvelous. Uh, there are uh, audio uh, introductions uh, that translate very well in virtual contexts, uh, audio introductions spoken with a male voice or female voice, and little meditation meditation exercises uh, that, they, um, that they offer. I'm going to give you uh, just a sound bite of the, the, the um, introduction spoken with the female voice and then um, the uh, breathing uh, exercise, uh, the little guidance uh, spoken by a male voice. Schön, dass du Lust hast auf unserem Achtsamkeitspfad, den Wald mit allen Sinnen zu erleben. Auf dem vor dir liegenden Weg erwarten dich verschiedene Übungen zur Schulung deiner Achtsamkeit. For the second example uh, on breathing. Stell dich bequem und aufrecht hin oder suche dir einen Sitzplatz auf dem Waldboden und nimm dort eine aufrechte Haltung an. So Under the categories breathing and walking and feeling and smelling and hearing, listening and seeing or watching, uh, you each time can, with this link, find an in, in introduction uh, that contextualizes it um, and then a kind of meditation ex exercise uh, that you are guided through uh, in the target language, um, but I'm sure they are in other contexts for other languages, there are similar tools available. In addition, the Schutzgemeinschaft Deutscher Wald offers a lot of material, uh, more informational material, um, um, experiential material, um, little printouts uh, that uh, correspond with the different senses uh, that we just talked about and the kind of possibility for experience, uh, opening your ears, eyes, and uh, perception to um, the other that is out there in the, in the forest. So I, I, I encourage you to try out whether maybe in your context there might be something available uh, that um, is similar to these uh, materials which work just wonderfully um, also um, in, in, in uh, remote teaching or in um, virtual teaching. So such a mindfulness exercise can be really a wonderful ex experience. And uh, once again, I've been trying to think about the habits of mind it fosters, and I could come up with a few points. And then uh, I was thinking on the level of um, what benefits uh, does it offer to students who are language learners? Uh, so the general benefits I list here, it encourages students to gather data through all senses, It invites students uh, to listen effectively with understanding and empathy. It allows students to respond to their environment with wonderment and awe. And um, uh, one of the um, wonderful things about such exercises is also that they translate so very well into the virtual classroom. The benefits linguistically for students who I don't know, want to practice the imperative uh, and can create an exercise that just breathe slowly, you know, feel your center. Uh, that, that is just also, there's a, 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 a wide field of uh, possibilities open there, how to make this useful. 
for your language learners in particular, but I think the benefits uh, are broader than just that. The fourth idea for an activity I wanted to share with you is creating with your students an art exhibition that consists of artworks that they have produced from upcycled materials. Uh, so two steps, the, uh, um, the process of, of creating these artworks uh, as a first step and then uh, um, exhibiting them in the class room context, that is the only way I have done it, uh, but you could uh, think larger and think of, um, I don't know, maybe exhibiting them uh, at our library or in, in some uh, other, other context uh, where they could uh, invite a larger audience. Of course, there are many online materials available for um, uh, upcycling art projects. Uh, I um, used some ideas uh, I found in the German version of the National Geographic uh, for children, actually, uh, um, whether a Geolino, where there were a number of I ideas for projects. And I, um, I discussed some with my students, some ideas, and um, remarkably enough, they did not imitate those ideas, but it was more of a springboard uh, that that unlock their own uh, create creativity. Creating artworks from recycled materials can really not just be fun, it can really, I think, help students um, question the concept of waste, what, what is waste. And in, in Chas, we are quite good about this. Uh, you see an image uh, below um, where, we, um, where, we, where we separate uh, between glass and um, cans and plastic uh, um, paper and, and then landfill materials, but it allows also students to be creative. Uh, if you create uh, um, an exhibition, uh, then uh, students can experience that the com community and it does not matter whether that is virtual or not. In fact, some, sometimes the virtual exhibition um, um, it's more accessible and sometimes easier for students to present uh, in, a, in, a, in a virtual for format. Um, I think it, it helps on a larger scale the environment and it helps our reflection on uh, possible improvements to practices here uh, at USU. And ultimately, it allows us to act more mindfully on campus and beyond. So again, there's a component of you know, learning, learning for life beyond the classroom. Another useful exercise uh, we have engaged in, um, in the virtual classroom and also in the actual classroom is, uh, is a type of monitoring project where I invite students to monitor their habits. Uh, what do they eat? Uh, how they, do they consume? How is the food wrapped? What kind of waste is associated with that? Um, to monitor it for the span of three days or a week, and then uh, either produce a kind of visual diary or um, get a short video or um, in whatever format they can be created if they're uh, given account of this experience of this um, project. I consider students monitoring their consumption habits in that way, um, particularly useful exercise. Um, on a general level, it stimulates creativity, imagination and innovation. Again, it motivates uh, students to strive for accuracy and it harnesses students' competitiveness, similar to the energy wars we used to have in the, in the different uh, dorms on campus uh, here on the Logan campus at uh, uh, USU, uh, the competitiveness uh, for a good cause. And I think it also encourages independent thinking. And uh, again, this is a format that can be shared um, easily electronically. Um, in, in German class, we usually do it via WhatsApp, which is culturally more uh, the most authentic way of, of doing so. But there are many other ways of, uh, of sharing word virtually um, uh, as opposed to in the classroom.
The last activity I'm going to talk about involves uh, writing a postcard. I invited uh, students in my classes to uh, write an imaginary postcard to climate activists like Greta Thunberg or for the German context, Lisa Neubauer. And uh, students have become um, tremendously creative with that. They've really taken the idea and run with it. I have found this exercise, creating an electronic postcard, um, particularly effective because students have become creative. Uh, they entered into a kind of imaginary dialogue. It improved their linguistic skills, in particular their writing skills uh, in the target language. But they also engaged in a process that involved several steps, some planning, and, and it allowed students to produce a finished product for which they really felt some ownership and to, you know, with emojis and uh, um, uh, images, create something that is really their own and represents their own voice. Looking back at this presentation and what it attempted, there are three things I would like to mention. I've always found it particularly useful in uh, teaching environmental cu culture to allow students to produce something um, either you know in the classroom or in the virtual classroom a real product or virtual product uh, something that allows them ownership um, students will invest so much more if they have that uh, um, possibility um, to involve their own creative potential and to come up with something that is not so closely choreographed that they feel they have to just fit into a system, but something that in, unlocks their own potential, and invites them to think and reflect and create independently. Second perspective uh, I'm going to talk about are practices. So um, engaging students in an awareness exercise or um, inviting them to monitor their own uh, consumption behavior is very useful um, because it engages students in a, in a project uh, that can you know, involve several steps. It uh, transcends, can transcend traditional learning formats and invite emotional learning, uh, not just cognitive uh, learning. So there's a wide range of experiential modes that these practices can draw on. And uh, lastly, um, um, perspectives. So I think in uh, teaching foreign language related uh, topics, it is always important to, to move kind of dialectically between the other, between that which you want to learn, uh, that which is foreign, and your own experiences, your own contexts. And um, uh, the perspectives that I've tried to open up the invitations to reflect on, on that which is different and that which is similar. And so uh, not to learn only something about, um, you know, the subject, the, the new subject, but also to learn about ourselves as we learn a language. And um, uh, all these products, practices and perspectives uh, in the examples that I offered were constructed around authentic material which to my mind is, is um, particularly important in the language learning context. I'll let you go now. Thank you for your time. Um, please share your questions, suggestions or comments uh, on this presentation. I'm very curious to learn about your own ideas and approaches, um, your suggestions for improvement. Uh, and I very much hope that this is the beginning of a conversation. So enjoy the other presentations uh, and the ETE conference and talk to you soon.